Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, and we're going to talk about its signaling pathway and also review a few of its important functions uh, in terms of neuroplasticity. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Now, before we discuss these signaling pathways, let's actually talk a little bit about the orientation of the cell here. So this right here at the top, this is our plasma membrane of whatever cell we're talking about. Okay, most likely a neuron, of course. Uh, in here is the cytoplasm, and down here is the nucleus. And here's some DNA that we see in the nucleus, and we're going to see that, that DNA eventually will be transcribed and translated. Now back up here to the plasma membrane, I've got these proteins, these dark blue proteins that are sandwiched in here, called TRKB. Now forget what that stands for, it's not important. These are actually the receptors for brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And so BDNF is circulating here in the extracellular fluid, um, and it'll eventually bind to a dimer of these two proteins. Okay? Uh, if BDNF were to just bind to one of these, it wouldn't work. Okay? So BDNF has to bind to a dimer of these two, so two of these receptor proteins. And they come close together. Now if you've watched my video, really playlist over signaling, uh, we actually talked about things like an insulin signaling pathway. And we talked about how when these two receptors actually dimerize like this, they autophosphorylate each other, meaning uh, this segment over here phosphorylates the other segment, and then this one in turn phosphorylates the other segment. Now I haven't shown that here, but this autophosphorylation, also called cross-phosphorylation, occurs here with TRKB, when BDNF binds and these two receptors dimerize. So when you have this situation right here with BDNF bound extracellularly to these receptors and they dimerize, they cross phosphorylate each other. And so if you zoomed in here on these receptors right here, down here in the cytoplasmic domain, you'd see a bunch of phosphates on particular amino acid residues. And that's important because once those proteins are phosphorylated, you'll see a string of other proteins that can attach uh, to these proteins. Now what's also important here is to notice that uh, this TRKB, this is a transmembrane protein. It has an extracellular component that's going to bind BDNF extracellularly. It has a transmembrane domain and it also has a cytoplasmic domain. And the cytoplasmic domain is very large and that's going to allow for that autophosphorylation but also these other proteins that are going to be recruited up toward the membrane um, and you're going to get a string of proteins that attach like this and they're going to attach on that cytoplasmic domain of the TRKB. Now in this picture we have three separate signaling pathways that are all going to be induced by BDNF and they'll actually all converge in some ways to get the same net effects which are going to be survival of cells Okay, so it's anti-apoptosis, growth of cells, and then also neuroplastic changes that we're going to see, for example, on the next few slides after this. The first signaling pathway is really an AKT pathway. Okay? Uh, we've seen AKT in skeletal muscle physiology, so we're going to see it here again. And the way this works is that once this autophosphorylation occurs, there's going to be a series of proteins here that are recruited uh, toward the membrane. The first one is SHC. GRB2, SOS, which is son of seven less, GAB1. The exact proteins here may or may not be important to you. What is important is that once these four proteins assemble here, they're able to recruit another protein, which is actually an enzyme here, to the membrane. So partially it sticks on GAB1, the other part of it interacts with the plasma membrane. That's PI3K. Now this is an enzyme that's actually going to catalyze a reaction on a membrane phospholipid. That's why it has to be recruited to the membrane. That phospholipid, excuse me, is PIP2, phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate, okay, PIP2. Now this is a kinase. So what it's going to do is it's actually going to phosphorylate PIP2 to basically make PIP3, which is phosphatidyl inositol trisphosphate, okay. And that's important because this PIP3 is also going to be able to recruit another protein to the membrane called PDK1. Okay? Now, PDK1 is only going to be associated with the membrane when there's a PIP3 present. And the only way there's going to be a PIP3 present is if there's a PI3K that's been recruited to the membrane by this protein complex right here. 
So once this PDK is in the membrane, it's going to act as a kinase, and it's going to phosphorylate AKT. Okay? Uh, when AKT is unphosphorylated, it's inactive. So by phosphorylating AKT, it activates AKT, and then AKT can go do various things. And one of the things that AKT does is it will initiate a string, or another, I could say a cascade, of other phosphorylations that lead to two net effects. One of these effects is actually going to be something independent of gene expression. It's going to act on things already in the cell, and those are going to be pro-survival and promoting neuroplasticity. Okay. Um, AKT can actually do this through a phosphorylation cascade independent of nuclear physiology. But AKT can also phosphorylate other proteins which are transcription factors that en then enter the nucleus and they induce transcription of the DNA, certain regions of it, certain genes, and those genes become expressed through transcription and translation and then those proteins also promote survival uh, neuroplastic changes and also growth. So what we see here is AKT, this pathway through phosphorylation cascades that are separate from one another, uh, can induce changes in the cell without uh, altering gene expression and some that require alteration of gene expression. Okay? And that pattern of two different mechanisms per pathway we're going to see in all three of these. All right? So that's the first pathway, that's the AKT pathway. The second one is the phospholipase C gamma pathway. Okay? Uh, phospholipase C is a phospholipase. Okay? It's going to act on a membrane phospholipid, also PIP2, but it's going to do something different than PI3K did over here on the left. Now this phospholipase C gamma is a particular type of phospholipase C that's actually going to be able to bind and interact with TRKB. Remember that this protein has been autophosphorylated. Uh, it's been phosphorylated by uh, this other subunit over here. So now we have phosphate sticking off of here. Phospholipase C gamma can interact with those. And in reality, it'd be a little bit closer to the membrane here, but I think you get the idea. What phospholipase C gamma is going to do, it's going to do its characteristic reaction. It's going to take this membrane phospholipid, phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate, and it's going to cleave it into two separate components. Okay, uh, the first component is diacylglycerol or DAG. This is still a lipid and it remains in the membrane. It doesn't go anywhere. We'll come back to that in a second. The other component which gets cleaved off is inositol trisphosphate, IP3. IP3 is an important second messenger in a lot of situations in the cell, uh, but what it generally is going to do is it's going to go to the endoplasmic reticulum not shown here and bind to a receptor, which is just an IP3 receptor. And when IP3 binds to that receptor on the endoplasmic reticulum, it's going to trigger the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. And so that means the cytosol is going to flood with calcium. Okay? Um, we saw something very similar to that in epinephrine physiology. Epinephrine also triggered the production of IP3, uh, but it's going to have different effects here. Okay? So IP3 triggers calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum. And now we have a bunch of calcium here in the cytosol. Well, there's also another protein here in the cytoplasm, or cytosol, called a CAMK. Uh, this is called calmodulin kinase. Calmodulin kinase is only active when it has bound calcium. So it's pretty handy that we just got a huge release of calcium because that calcium can then go bind to CAMK or calmodulin kinase and activate it. Okay? And when calmodulin kinase becomes activated, take a wild guess what it phosphorylates. Calmodulin. And so the whole idea is you're going to get a series of phosphorylations that ultimately phosphorylate a transcription factor that goes into the nucleus and activates some particular genes. They get transcribed, translated, expressed, and they're going to be also promoting survival, growth, and neuroplastic changes. Now again, calmodulin kinase can also have effects within the cell independent of gene expression, so using things the cell already has made, um, and those are going to be promoting uh, neuroplastic changes. All right? Now, going back to the originally in this uh, signaling pathway, the diacylglycerol or DAG that's generated through the action of phospholipase C gamma. Remember, PIP2 or PIP2 is cleaved into IP3 and DAG. Well, that DAG is still a lipid. You can look up its chemical structure on Google. Um, it's really just a, a diacylglycerol, right? So it's a fat. 
stays bound in the membrane, and that's pretty handy because um, there are some proteins like this one, uh, protein kinase C, that stick to DAG. Okay, so by sticking to DAG, uh, DAG is able to localize protein kinase C, the membrane. And at the membrane, it's going to have some biological effects. Um, one of those is going to be to promote uh, neuroplastic changes. And again, it's doing that uh, really independently of um, any kind of changes in gene expression. It's promoting that neuroplastic change via things that the cell already has present in it. Now this third pathway over here, um, you'll notice I have another BDNF and another set of receptors here. Um, I only did that just because I, of course, ran out of space on this set of receptors right here. But again, it's going to operate as a third independent biosignaling pathway. Now you'll notice here that there's a lot of the same proteins here that we saw in the first pathway. Um, again, we have cross-phosphorylated proteins right here, TRKB. They've got phosphate sticking on them, and that's going to attract these proteins over here. So SHC, GRB2, SOS, son of 7 list, GAB1. But in this case, GAB1 is going to recruit a different protein to the membrane, and that protein is called RAS. Now, if you have seen, again, the insulin signaling video or have any knowledge of that, you'll notice that this pathway is very similar to the insulin pathway. In fact, it's almost identical, um, even down to these uh, kinases right here. This is just a MAP kinase cascade. The only difference is we have a different molecule that's triggering this. Instead of insulin, it's brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. So RAS is recruited to the membrane. Now RAS um, is going to be able to activate RAF1. Okay? RAF1 is a kinase. And so when RAF1 becomes activated, it phosphorylates and activates MEK, M-E-K. M-E-K is also a kinase, so it's going to then phosphorylate and activate ERK, ERK. ERK is also a kinase, so you can see we have this cascade of kinases. So when ERK becomes activated, um, it's going to phosphorylate a number of proteins, uh, most of which are transcription factors. Okay? Um, and so those transcription factors, when they're phosphorylated and activated by ERK, they're going to be able to translocate into the nucleus, bind to specific genes, and upregulate them. So basically those genes get transcribed, translated and expressed, and they're going to have effects on survival, meaning pro-survival, uh, growth of the cell, and neuroplastic changes. Now it's also important to know that ERK also has effects on these three things within the cell, um, again independent of gene expression. So it's going to be able to act on things already in the cell and promote changes here. But it should be known that any long-term changes in uh, growth of the cells, neuroplasticity, those long-term changes are really going to require the gene expression. Okay, um, If there's no gene expression and we only have these short-term mechanisms, um, it may just be that, short-term, uh, because you're not actually having long-lasting changes in the cell. The only way to have long-lasting changes is by altering gene expression, in particular by upregulating genes involved in survival, growth, and neuroplasticity. Now let's just do a brief review of the effects that we have from BDNF. So here I have two multipolar neurons. Okay? Um, one of the effects of brain-derived neurotrophic factor is simply neurogenesis. Now you see here, the only thing I've added are just more neurons. And so neurogenesis really is just the growth of new neurons. Okay? I have new neurons here. Now, neurogenesis by itself, that term, uh, does not imply that those neurons connect with each other. It just means I have new neurons. So, of course, what I have to do is I have to form connections between these neurons. So, for example, synaptogenesis. Okay? So, um, you can see here that, relative to this initial picture, um, I now have these neurons coming closer together. Okay? Now, this large blue circle right here, this is the cell body of the neuron, and these small pink circles are the dendrites. Okay, so one example is we could have the axon of this neuron now has formed a synapse uh, with this dendrite right here. And so it's not good enough to just have a uh, growth of new neurons. You have to have a way to use them and a specific useful way to use them. And so for example, if you're learning a new motor skill, uh, the neurons in the circuit involved in doing that particular motor skill are going to have not only maybe new neurons, but especially 
more synapses formed between the axon of one neuron and the dendrite of another. And so this process where you're getting more synapses is called synaptogenesis. Another thing that you can do is you can strengthen synapses. Now, the way I'm showing this is very abstract. Okay, I've just shown this by thickening the axons. Understand uh, the axons don't actually thicken. Okay, I'm just simply trying to demonstrate that you're going to strengthen the synapse, and you're not actually doing it by thickening the axon or anything like that. Uh, really what you're doing at the chemical level is you're actually increasing the number of certain types of receptors for the neurotransmitter released at this axon on the dendrite. So for example, in this situation right here, if this axon released, let's say, glutamate into the synapse, well then, by strengthening the synapse, this dendrite would actually express more glutamate receptors. And so by increasing the number of receptors to the neurotransmitter, you strengthen the synapse. And that's one mechanism uh, by which that occurs. And that mechanism is actually called long-term potentiation. And I have a separate video on that uh, that I'll try to remember to link in the description of the video. If not, you can search for it on my channel. But that's really the basis of neuroplasticity. We have neurogenesis, making new neurons, synaptogenesis, making new synapses between those neurons, and then eventually strengthening the, strengthening the synapse uh, once we determine that that's a particular neural circuit that we want to start using a lot. Okay, If you're using a neural circuit a lot, you want to strengthen the synapse. Okay, um, And hopefully this mechanism a brain-derived neurotrophic factor makes sense to you and gave you some good information there. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.